Uh, actually, there's a, there's a missing component here, and it's a guy named John Bollinger, who's a singer-songwriter in Nashville, who I've known for many years. In fact, I'm a, uh, my job was a, has always been as a music publisher, which, as I, re I said a few minutes ago, is kind of like a pimp. We really don't have any talent, but hopefully we get yours and, and use you and then abuse you and then let you go uh, when you no longer can perform for us. Uh, and, uh, and John is actually someone that I, I never did publish, but I, I seriously considered publishing. Um, John is a really creative type. In fact, is, if you look him up on uh, you know, like, uh, w Wikipedia or whatever, you'll actually uh, find not John, but his, uh, his father, who is the uh, lieutenant governor, and I think in the past maybe he's been the governor of Montana, and flips back and forth. And, and uh, so anyway... Uh, John, John is really creative. He's from Montana, and he uh, and uh, he uh, went to Columbia. It was uh, uh, Pi Beta Kappa at Columbia, and, he came, and then his father said, "Now come back to Montana, and you can be governor too." And John said, "I want to go to Nashville and be a hillbilly." And uh, so anyway, he came to Justin and I a few years ago and said, uh, uh, "What do you think about the concept that the?" that uh, the songwriter, especially the national songwriter, because of their storytelling uh, songs, are really the ultimate short, short story writers. That, that what they're doing is really uh, um, writing the ultimate short story. And, they, and he, right there at the table, gave us the best example, which was Marty Robbins' El Paso, which in literally less than three minutes... Marty Robbins tells this epic tale of love and loss and uh, murder and, and all sorts of things. And, uh, and he said, what if you got songwriters to try to write short stories? And um, at that point, a lot of people were coming uh, to both Justin and I, both were doing different projects with their ideas, and I wasn't really interested. I don't think Justin was in any of them. But this immediately was something we were really interested in. So we went home, and I sent to my friends um, an email and just said, you know, what would you think about writing a short story on any any subject? Could even be nonfiction, fiction, nonfiction. Could hopefully it's not how you wrote a song, but a really a story, and uh, and it could be as long as you want, uh, from two and a half pages to uh, you know forty pages. Doesn't matter. And, uh, and try your hand at it. And it was really amazing. Uh, the first person that we got back with us was Chris Christopherson and, uh, and has a wonderful story in there. And then uh, other people slowly came forward. I saw um, Bobby Braddock at dinner one night, and I told him the idea. I th Bobby's a really distracted kind of person, and he didn't literally, clearly was not listening to what I said. And so when I... He said he would do it, and then when I sent him the, uh, the, the, the basically the email I'd sent out to other people, he immediately wrote back, and he just said, there's no way I can do that. I thought you were talking about me writing about how I wrote a song. Um, I can't do that. <clears throat> so I wrote him back, and I said, okay, Bobby, I understand, um, but if you, ever dis if you ever change your mind, I would love you to consider it, and to which he wrote back and said, I, I can't believe you're trying to hound me about this. I, I told you once I can't do this. Stop, stop, stop demanding that I do that. I did, so I went back and read my email because I was like, did, was my de email really demanding? And it, it didn't seem very demanding. So I wrote back and I said, I completely understand. And um, I didn't mean for you to take it in a demanding way. And, I, you, know, you know, you've written the greatest country song of all time. In case someone doesn't know, he stopped loving her today. And, uh, and I said, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I wish you'd change your mind, but I completely understand if you don't want to. To which he wrote back, I cannot believe you keep bothering me. <laughs> Lose my email address. You have no right to be hounding me about this. I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. Do you understand this now? What part don't you understand? So I didn't write him back. And a week later, he sent us a story. <laughs> now, if anyone
anyone can figure this out. I don't know. But anyway, and it's a wonderful story, and it's actually in here, and it's, uh, it's uh, I'm not going to, uh, he read, read it the other night and didn't read the end, but basically it's between a, a guy and a, a man and a woman who meet on the, in a chat room and decide to get together. And uh, it really is a, it's a wonderful, wonderful story, and I, I really, I love the story. But other people were not as great. Uh, 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 Don Schlitz, it'll be the only name I'll name, Don Schlitz. The Gambler, one of the greatest story songs of all time. Um, I just walked up to him and told him the idea, and he just put his hand out and he said, I will never do that. So there were other, so it was things like that. So uh, anyway, but the bottom line is, is that we're really proud of the stories. Um, now, there's, there is, I should make a disclaimer, and that is, I, uh, I have a story in here, and I, uh, I am not a songwriter. And it is not because I wanted to have a story in here. It's because uh, when we signed this uh, a deal with uh, my, our publisher, um, they made me write a story. And so if you, if you read the book and you say, he's not a songwriter, you are correct. And, um, and I also am not a short story writer either. So it was very, uh, it was, it, it, I realized the only thing I'm glad about is, um, is that um, uh, I actually know how hard it is to write a short story now. And um, my short story is about, is actually based on a true story, although it is, I have changed the names to protect everyone. And it's about the time when I was eight years old. Um, and I don't think I'm going to read it to y'all. Uh, you have to buy the book. Uh, <laughs> When I was eight years old, uh, my family, um, on my father's side, decided to eat one of our relatives who had died. And so uh, they, they, the older people cooked him up, and we ate him. And then we never talked about it again. And, um, and we have not talked about it since I'm 57, since I was eight years old. And so somehow... Uh, a month or so ago before the book came out, my cousin Sally, I guess I shouldn't have told her name, but anyway, she called me up. My cousin Sally's in her 60s, called me up and she said, um, Robert, uh, this is your cousin Sally. And I went, hey Sally, how are you doing? She goes, I'm not doing real well, to tell you the truth. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, well, there is a nasty story going through the family that you have possibly written about us. And I went, is this about, uh, I have written a story um, about us, about our family, yes. And she said, and it's about something unpleasant? And I said, well, it's about uh, when we ate Uncle Homer. <laughs> And she said, Robert, th this is uh, completely unpleasant. And I said, well, the, the deal is, is I changed his name to Willis. So no, there's no Willis's in our family, so no one will ever know. She goes, I do not think that's a thick enough cover. And <laughs> so I said, and she goes, Robert, let me just say, this is not right. And I said, is it not right that we ate Uncle Homer? <laughs> Or that I wrote about it. And Sally said, you know, Robert, I should have told this to you when you were little, but I didn't because I was trying to be nice and you were blood and all. But you have never known when to put a lid on things and hung up. So anyway, so uh, I'm not, we're not doing a book event in West Tennessee. <laughs> fear that some people are still upset. But anyway, so it was kind of fun to actually finally get that that tale out of uh, eating a relative. So I'm, in, I'm doing this book event, this real she-she, not that this isn't, um, book event, author event, and, uh, and it's uh, Southern Death, Southern Foods, Southern... I've forgotten what all it was. It was like four things, and I had four or five authors. And I wasn't even thinking about this, and during the question and answer, this lady got up and she said, have any of you ever written about a particularly favorite meal you had? <laughs> so I had just uh, written uh, this story, and so uh, I said, well, actually, I, uh, I did uh, write... Um, 
I personally did write about um, uh, a meal, and that was um, when I was eight years old, uh, one of my great uncles by marriage had died, and we, we ate him, and uh, they cooked him and ate him, and, uh, and, and so these people got real quiet and kind of nervously laughed and didn't talk about it, but afterwards I was at this reception and this lady came up to me, this very, very she-she woman, and she said, you know, I'm really very impressed because it's so pagan that you did that. <laughs> and I said, did what? And she said, ate a relative who you loved. She goes, I love that. I'm, I'm somewhat of a pagan myself, and I love the idea that you ate one of your loved ones. And I went, well... I actually don't think we liked him at all. I mean, he was a total ass. And, and this woman recoiled in horror, and she just said, you ate someone you hated? And I went, yes. And she went, that's sick. When did that change? I mean, when when did it, you know, you only eat those you love. I mean, you know, it's like I went, oh, and she just went, sick, and walked away from me. So anyway, uh, we didn't like him, and uh, and we did eat him. But, uh, and I think, I'm hoping the statue, I, and we didn't kill him. I want to, if you don't buy the book, and you're mean if you don't, but uh, if you don't, <laughs> He don't. Uh, I just want to clarify. We did not kill him. He was dead when we ate him. It was just we took care of him afterwards. But uh, anyway, so uh, so that's that. And um, Justin, do you have anything to say or just just a couple of basics? Um, this project is seven now. So it was a long project. Like this. Six years. Um, also, it's not like we had a specific checklist um, for or criteria for the short story. We asked for submissions from many, many uh, contributors, and and we went through and looked for just great entertainment factor. It was not on an academic level, but we have some really great stories. So we hope you'll read it and and enjoy. And that's and that's what I would say. It's it is a little different um, in that with a lot of stories is that uh, the universal theme is that we really want to tell stories. And so I will go on record as saying that this is not qualified at the bookstore, our record store, but if you all buy it and you don't like it, you can go to thewoodofthesouth.com and I'll send you your money back if you if you are so ballsy as to say you didn't like it. <laughs> After I signed your damn book. But... Uh, but anyway, and, and there's some great people in here, and I'm really, I'm really, I'm really, really proud of this. And it's easier for me to, uh, to promote this book uh, than it is for me to promote The Wood of the South, and I was pretty good at that um, because uh, I really love. There's some really, really wonderful stories in in the book, and uh, and uh, I'm I'm really, really proud of. Them. Does anyone have any questions? Good question, first of all. Great question. <laughs> we all have different answers, the three editors. Um, Bobby Braddock's story had the most surprising ending for me, and I think Robert would probably agree with that. Uh, but I enjoyed Tim Putnam's story, which is a Western, which... Uh, it didn't make sense with a lot of the other stories. In fact, that was the only Western that was and, and so that was interesting for me. What about you, Robert? Um, His own story. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised. I was really surprised how hard it is to write a short story. Seriously, guys. Um, I found it excruciating. And my only hope is, is that it's a story, and I'm not... Um, uh, that I will continue to work on in the years to come. I mean, I really do. It's like a poem in a sense. As opposed to a novel, you can't do that. And it is a story that I feel like I can make it better. I'm, I, I'm, I'm fine with it, and I, I want you all to read it. But um, but uh, I would say Tia Sellers is a wonderful... Um, you know, she wrote I Hope You Dance and stuff, and she wrote a lot of popular songs. And she wrote a song... Uh, I mean, she wrote a story about... 
um, about a, a girl who wanted to be a boy. And um, she's very happily married and, and very happily straight. And uh, but it's 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 about someone wanting to please her father, and uh, and it's a it's a wonderful story, you know. Um, Tom T. Hall is just one of the most beautiful stories in the book, and of course we know he's a writer, but it's about a, a boy killing a rabbit, and it's 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 not sentimental, it's just it's it's excruciatingly painful in, in a at, at a moment. It, it's just a beautifully written story, and I mean, so you know. Uh, I don't know. Chris Christopherson's is kind of a tribute to uh, the Taliban. It's about a um, it's about a boy and a father who are riding out west after a big gully wash, and uh, a mountain has been washed away, and what it what what's left is a big rock that looks like a giant woman doing something um, erotic, if not obscene. And it's really just a rock. It's it's not like it was carved or anything. But anyway, of course, him being a kid, this kid goes and gets his best friend, and then everyone in town, and then people really start having to deal with this rock. Like, is there something like intrinsically wrong with this rock because it looks like this woman doing something obscene? And uh, and 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 kind of how we deal with stuff. So so. Uh, I, I saw quite a few of them surprise me. Anything else? What else? Come on. Well, I'm curious why um, you think books are hard to write short stories. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, to uh, try to just, uh, as you can tell, I talk a lot. So that would be the first problem we faced. Um, but just trying to get it down to something and reduce it to uh, and get the whole story in. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy, I don't think it's an easy thing. I mean, I, I kind of thought it would be. We had a fantastic editor, and we got her really by default. Um, we the the person at the publishing house that loved the story, loved the book concept, loved country music. Um, her husband got into Trinity Theological School in Chicago, and she had to leave. And so all of a sudden, we we inherited a new editor named Christine Christina Boyce, and Christina was. Uh, and that's so scary because this wasn't her project. She wasn't passionate. She she had, wasn't the initial passionate person about it. And she really was. She took. A, it turned out she was a great editor. And I mean, we claim we're the editors, but it was really her uh, passion for it, thoroughness. that thoroughness. Um, that, that we're very very lucky because you can be. It can be a dangerous territory. Yes, sir. With my short story, my short story, probably uh, two rewrites in all, three times I wrote it, and I would like to write it again. Um, you know, I find editing, <coughs> and I found this with the uh, first novel, and I'm really, uh, I just sold the second novel. I mean, they just approved taking it literally this week. And uh, Justin can tell you, I, I've not been a happy person because... I all of a sudden realized I'm now going to enter into the world of editing. And, uh, and editing on the front end is just excruciating. And then on the back end, it, it's, like, it's like Michael Jackson in plastic surgery. You just, you can get really addicted to it. You know, and one day you wake up and your book doesn't have a nose. You know, and it's, uh, and if anyone's a friend of Michael, I'm sorry. And I think, but I'm I'm really serious about that. You it, editing, you can. Uh, I edited my first novel seven times completely, and finally went to my editor and said, I think I'm going to start losing voices. If and so de I said probably in about three weeks I'll ask for it back. And don't let me have it back. And my editor, Amy Einhorn, who was fantastic, said, I, I think that's very wise. And within a week, I called her and said, just kidding, send it back. And she said no. I have to understand, many, many changes, but he's talking about complete, you know, editing. Thoroughly. Are you a writer? Yes. Good, 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 good to admit it. You know, that's the first step. 
<laughs> I have to say your name first. <laughs> This is your first step. Just know when, yeah. to, know when to stop. I'm sure there's people you have to apologize to. But uh, uh, you can start with my cousin, you can apologize for me. But uh, no, uh, you know, that's a, that can destroy you. You know, I mean, you know, but it really does uh, get to the point that you just, you, you can start losing that. But so anyway, I did it, I did it twice, I reread it twice, completely. And uh, and and I and I can tell you, I'm still. If I had the chance, I'd probably rewrite it again. I don't read. I don't read it because I would like start wanting to change. Oh gosh, I shouldn't have said it that way. Does that make sense? What else? Yes, ma'am. How how did you pick your topic for your slips already? Did you have something specific that you wanted to say, to say and then think back about? Don't eat family. <laughs> uh, let me say this. I, 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 it, it, I have always known in the back of my mind I wanted to tell this story someday. I mean, because, it, it, you know, as I said in it somewhere, something to the fact, even in, a, even in my family, this was kind of odd that <laughs> we did this kind of stuff. But, I, you know, it's like, it's like they had this wonderfully great people who were all big Methodist Episcopalians when it was still the same thing and they really loved Jesus and they uh, and my my grandmother was five foot eleven and she uh, she said I'm not greedy the other grandmothers can have them the other nine months a year I just want three and we had seven 24 hour days after school ended literally all over the world two of my cousins lived in Paris three lived in LA a couple lived here in Atlanta. Um, we lived in South Florida. We seventeen grandchildren would merge at her farm, and it was this incredibly eccentric farm, surrounded by black and white people who really were all somehow related to us because of uh, birth or because of the indiscretions of my great grandfather. And uh, and you know some of the black people looked like their mother and some of them looked like us and they were all there and they uh and so uh, we had this incredible childhood i mean with these all these nutty people you know surrounded by all these nutty people and as my grandmother's s siblings husbands and wives died they all moved back to her house so you it was this house full of elderly black and white people uh, who were all like really nuts, but but kind of not malicious or mean. They were just nuts, and and so I always knew I wanted to write. I mean, there are other things I'd like to write about them. Um, um, you know Robert for long. You know he has a lot of great stories, and this happened to be the one that was the most pressing at the time. And, and uh, to, to answer, we question. never ate another relative. <laughs> we didn't. I promise. It's not. You know, it doesn't happen in our family that often. <laughs> but anyway, my, my great grandmother was a sweet person, and she, her best friend was her maid, who was also her, her um, sister-in-law by marriage. It was she was, she was married to, was the widow of my grandfather's half brother, who was black. So I said, you know, so. Uh, so uh, they, but they loved each other. These two women, they loved each other, and they and uh, and uh, my grandmother decided on Sunday night all the other servants would go away, and when the children, weren't, when the grandchildren weren't there, it was just these two elderly women. One was five foot eleven, my grandmother, and Minnie, the most inappropriately named person on earth, who was six foot one. Minnie, <laughs> Minnie Nichols Hicks was uh, was this black lady. They and she couldn't eat in our dining room, in my grandmother's dining room, because she was black. And so my grandmother would move to the kitchen, and they would eat their meals together on at the kitchen counter, sitting at stools. Well, there wasn't a place to duck your feet, and they would sit there until my grandmother finally made the decision before she died that she wanted to go back to the dining room and she wanted Minnie to eat with her. It became a huge issue. Minnie was didn't think it was appropriate. And so my grandmother had to um, work through this, but you know, so there were there. It was a very eccentric family of people. So I wanted to write about them. What else? Yes. 
Where, where, I mean, I'm sorry. Go on. Where, where did your grandmother live? Uh, <clears throat> we, we lived in a little town in, in West Tennessee that doesn't exist anymore named Hicksville, Tennessee, which my father said was more than a name, it was a definition. <laughs> and all the children had fled it. All my father's generation had fled. And I, it has now been absorbed into Jackson, Tennessee, which we always thought was Greater Hicksville. But people, people in Hicksville, uh, people in Jackson, obviously didn't think so. So, anyway, it was a great, it was a great place to grow up, <coughs> spend your summers. It really was. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, really? We would, we would, we would like to do, uh, uh, we would like to do other. I mean, we we really started out thinking that that country music had, uh, you know, because of the story song was the only place. But we would love to do it with, with other, with other genres of songwriters because we got such great stories and we have a lot of other stories that we literally came to the point that the publisher said you know we we want to narrow it down to 25 stories so yeah we would love to do it again for sure I mean we're getting reviews all over the country and they've all been favorable and, and what that's telling us I and mean, people like you will come out to an event like this you know, it, it, John's <laughs> yeah. John John's uh, if he doesn't buy a <laughs> no, make it, make it two now. No, but, but John's theory that you know the songwriter is the ultimate short story writer that really can tell a story um, in different mediums. You know, it, this is all just kind of validating that theory, so it's, it's working. Yeah, we're very happy. Being a publisher, you know, a thing or two about songwriting. What do you think of any short story writers or fiction writers? Do you think? Would Great songs. Uh, uh, Henry would have probably done great. I mean, yeah, I think I think that that, that um, the the problem is is that it was, and that was one reason it was so difficult to get a lot of songwriters. Like, it wasn't difficult. Tom T. Hall's already crossed over, and uh, he's not dead. He's written other things, and and uh, Charlie and Charlie Daniels, Daniels and and Chris Christopherson, you know, Rhodes Rhodes Scholar. But, but for so many of them, it was a real, real struggle because they are so trained to, uh, to write that, you know, within this many minutes, we have to get this story out. And I think the same thing happens with, with, with um, short story writers. Now, I will say this. Uh, what I'm also hoping will come out of this, I really believe Tia Sellers and, you know, I think Marshall Chapman obviously is going to continue to write. And I really hope that we're going to get a whole bunch of, of, of really good writers out of this whole project in the years to come. I mean, uh, I saw um, Don Cook the other night at a party, and he told me that he's written, he had never written before this book, and he said he's written three short stories since. And so that's good, because I, you know, I think that, that these, these men and women are going to be here at your store in the years to come and they will be doing things and that's that was part of the whole idea so so but it is hard to get the two groups to cross over you know and it's equally hard to get short story writers to think they can write a song I mean maybe maybe someone needs to uh, maybe uh, we need to try to get short story writers together and uh, and try to see if they want to write everything what else Yes, ma'am. Dolly Parton. Yeah, Dolly Parton. And she could have done it. It was so close. I mean, we had several attempts, and she's just so busy. She tried. No, she, no, she didn't. And, and, but we, we really, um, Dolly, uh, if you ever had, did you ever have Little Sparrow? That's all at my house. That was all photographed at my house. And I've known Dolly for years, and uh, 
Um, but it's just the schedule. It's, it's just her schedule is just so unbelievable. And that was the whole thing of just sitting down with her and trying to get her. I mean, she's a great storyteller, and she could have done it. But, yeah, we would have loved to have Dolly Parton. And uh, from a marketing standpoint, our publisher wanted us to get someone newer also who was really hip, you know, maybe Keith Urban or something. It would great. That line. Brad Paisley is someone who could have done it. He's a great storyteller. And, uh, and again, it was the, in fact, I asked him several times, and Justin and his wife and I and another friend were eating. At, there's a restaurant in Franklin called Dotson's. It's in a, if you've ever been to Franklin, Tennessee, it's in, a, it's in three double wides. And it's an it's a meeting three. And I came in one Sunday and sat down in one of the rooms and I looked at her and I said, This is really sad because Brad and his wife uh, is an actress and they're Kim and they're great people. They're really sweet people. And and Brad Kim was facing was on our on our, we were on her left side and Brad, we were on his right side as they're facing each other. And they both when they saw me sit down for horror that I would ask them again, they had decided to put their hands up and hide their face, which was fine for her because she's right-handed, so she could keep on eating. But he's right-handed, too, and he had his hand up, and he couldn't cut food. And I, I turned to Justin and his wife, and I said, Wait, let's watch this. So we're sitting across from them. They ate the entire meal with one hand, trying not to be seen, because they knew I was going to get up and ask them, and I just thought, Man, if it's come to that, I'm not going <laughs> to I won't ask again. And they're really great people and uh, do a lot of good things. But, yeah, so there, are, there were some people that we really would have loved. But then Robbie Fuchs and, and people like that, we, we were just we were so blown away by, you know, them. And so we, we felt like we had well made up for whatever it was. What else? Okay. You can't, you know, between now and the end of December, you're all going to buy presents for people that cost $25. <laughs> and you need to spend that money tonight in this bookstore. So anyway, listen, thank you guys very, very much. And we'll, we'll subscribe them.